Good evening. Take your Bibles, please. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Way back in July of last year, we started on Sunday night studying the book of Acts. Then I moved it to Wednesday nights, but we've had so many interruptions and with everything that's going on right now and not able to meet, I really like to kind of recap what we have already done. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in Acts chapter 1, and every night at 7 o'clock, Monday through Friday, we're going to have something on our YouTube channel or on the Facebook page, and you can watch a Bible study from the book of Acts. So the first two weeks, the first 10 lessons approximately, maybe 12 lessons, will be a recap of what we've already done. Of course, when I preach, it never comes out the same. And so there'll be principles that I'm drawing out that'll be a little bit newer and fresher and maybe more relevant for today. But I would encourage you to start over with me and let's do a Bible study while we are quarantined. I hope that it's a blessing to you. And of course, you don't have to watch it at seven o'clock at night. Once it is posted, you can go to the YouTube channel or Facebook page and watch it anytime you want. And so we'll start today in Acts chapter one, and we're going to work our way through the book of Acts uh, while we are quarantined together. So Acts chapter one, and this, this evening we're going to look at the first nine verses. I hope to keep these lessons right around 20 or 25 minutes. All right, we're not going to have a full 45 or 50 minutes. Maybe once in a while we'll drift into that if we're trying to finish a thought. But um, we're going to keep them 20, 25 minutes, almost devotional, if you will, uh, so that we can just kind of take small bites on and work our way through the book of Acts. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles, which he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou now at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they behold, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, and we pray, Lord, as we re-examine part of the book of Acts and then venture into new territory and study out the rest of the book, that your Holy Spirit would teach us. Lord, it's an exciting time in the church. It's right after uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and shown himself alive on the earth and is about to be taken to heaven. And he leaves the Holy Spirit on Acts chapter two. And, and so many things are happening and miracles are taking place and the explosion of the gospel. What an exciting time. And Lord, we pray that you help us as we read it to sense uh, what is going on that the Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us into all truth. Father, I need your help. Fill me with thy spirit now, we pray. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, in Acts chapter 1, we have a literal, physical encounter with Jesus Christ. There were several before that, and I must say that every time somebody met the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a life-changing experience. I'm reminded that Mary was one that sat at his feet, and the Bible says she hath chosen the best part, and it shall never be taken away from her. She worshiped at the feet of Jesus. She was changed by being in his presence. The disciples, <coughs> excuse me, on the road to Emmaus met him and said, did not our heart burn within us? The Thomas saw the, the prince in his hands and declared, my Lord, and my God, Saul met him on the road to Damascus and cried, My Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Surely meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ is a life-changing experience. You know, there's a lot of things in this day and age that we concern ourselves with. The number one concern that we must have is getting into the presence of God. Now, let me say this. We don't come into his physical presence. But here's the good news. 
Jesus told the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4 that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The Bible also tells us that where two or three are gathered in his name, that there Jesus is in the midst of us. And so we have that wonderful opportunity to meet in the presence of Christ. We should be concerned less with a lot of things and concern ourselves more with getting in the presence of Christ. Let me give you some examples. We often concern ourselves about our marriages. Our marriage is an important thing. It is the second most important relationship you have besides your relationship with God. It is so important that we have seminars and retreats and all kinds of books are written upon the topic of marriage. But friend, let me say this. If you will get into the presence of Jesus... He'll help your marriage. He'll change your heart towards your spouse. He'll strengthen your lives as you walk together in the presence of God. Are you concerned about your family standards? Get them in the presence of Christ. Too often we have rules and regulations for our homes. and That's not wrong. Parents are to set standards for their children. But they don't always understand why. But if God can get a hold of their heart by moving them into His presence... Then they'll desire to live a life that is holy and right before God. Are you struggling with your tongue? Spend time with Jesus. He'll clean it up. You know, it's interesting. I, I remember when I was a boy, my father would very rarely answer the phone. It was my mom that worked from home. And, and so every once in a while, though, I'd hear my dad answer the phone. And uh, he'd say, hello. And, of course, go into the regular salutations. But if it was an old friend or a buddy... His voice would change. Oh, how are you? And, and some of those expressions would come out and things would come out in, his, in his, his talk and in his voice that I could almost guess who was on the other end of the phone. You know, we are like that. Our voice changes. My wife says when I get down into Missouri or Texas, I, I, I begin to talk like a Southerner. I, I lived for four years in Missouri and, and I picked up their accent while I was there. And, and I remember my high school principal saying, I, I didn't even recognize something you said because of the change of your language. It's interesting that when we get into somebody's presence, our language changes. You may use words with certain people you wouldn't use with others. And friend, if you'll just get into the presence of Christ, It'll change your language. Are you struggling with addiction? Come to Jesus. Get into his presence. I want you to notice some things about what happens when we meet with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I may not always, as we teach through this book, always pull out some of the principles and things verse by verse, but I would like to give you some solid Bible principles from them. Some things that the Lord has laid upon my heart. And I want you to notice that as the apostles or the disciples here met with Jesus, the first thing we notice is it edified them. Meeting with Jesus edifies. Look what it says in verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. The Bible here in verses 1 through 3 is an introduction the Bible says that the author, we believe to be Luke, is saying this former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. Theophilus means the lover of God, one who loves God, of all that Jesus both began both to do and teach. And so he says, I'm going to write a, uh, an account of all that Jesus did or teach this former treatise I gave you. And now we're going to have the Acts of the Apostles. He's going to tell us that I wrote until the day in which he was taken up. And after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Now listen, by many infallible proofs. You know, Jesus had to prove himself to the disciples. We know Thomas has the nickname of Doubting Thomas, but the truth is all the disciples were doubters. The Bible says many times that they did not understand that Jesus told them he would die, bury, and be risen again until after he rose again, and then they remembered all those things. They were doubters. You'll remember that Jesus was talking to Peter. He said, whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And it was just moments later that Jesus said, I'm going to, decide, I'm going to Jerusalem. And Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God. 
It's interesting how quickly the disciples would go from a great statement of faith, the very bedrock of the church that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God to a point of unbelief and not trusting in God's plan. But that was the disciples. And frankly, that's you and I. But notice what the Bible says in verse 3, he proved himself alive after his passion or after his death by many infallible proofs. You know, when you get in the presence of Jesus, it strengthens your faith. It was proof that Jesus was alive. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and and receive you unto myself. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Can you imagine the promise of God would mean nothing if they had not gotten into the presence of the living Savior? How can Jesus go to a place called heaven and prepare a place for us and come again and receive us unto himself if he's laying dead in a tomb? But the Bible says he rose again. And through these many infallible proofs appearing time and time again in 40 days from the time he died till his re- uh, till the time that he would uh, ascend into heaven, those 43 days we know uh, from his death, we know that it proved to the disciples that Jesus was alive. Meeting with Jesus edifies, it strengthens our faith. Promises and prophecies will only take you so far without a resurrected Jesus. Let me say that again. Promises and prophecies will only take you so far without a resurrected Jesus. The resurrection was proof that Jesus was who he said he was and could do what he said he could do. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Boy, I'm telling you, to believe in a risen Savior will strengthen your faith. That's why I like Resurrection Sunday so much. It's a reminder that all the promises of the Bible are true. It's a reminder that if God can conquer death in the grave, that he certainly can go to heaven and prepare a place for me, that he can save my wretched, sin-sick soul, that he can may give me a home in heaven one day, and that he's coming again, and I can trust in all of his promises. Meeting with Jesus will strengthen your faith. It edifies. Secondly, Meeting with Jesus encourages. It's an encouragement to know that to come into the presence of Christ. Why well, I'm never so excited and so happy when I know that Jesus has showed up. When you feel the presence of God move into the room and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart and your soul and you get excited about the things of God, there's nothing better. There's no greater feeling. And there's that presence like Joshua had at the temple when he heard God speaking to Moses face to face as a man speaking to a friend. The Bible says Moses returned to the camp, but Joshua stayed right there because he didn't want to leave the presence of God. Hey, there's no better feeling. Can you imagine... The disciples hiding in the upper room, fearful of everyone outside, wondering if everything you believed in and the one that you loved and trusted now lying in a grave. If anything would ever be the same again, all your hopes were gone. But then the risen Jesus walks in the room. You'll remember he was in the upper room, or they were in the upper room, and Jesus walked right through the wall. Why wouldn't that encourage your heart? Wouldn't that be a blessing to know that it wasn't all for naught? Jesus was in the assembly. The Bible says in verse 4, and being assembled together with them. Jesus was there with them. He was there loving them and encouraging them and helping them. And and he was out there on that hillside about to be ascended and giving them the promise once again of his Holy Spirit. And Jesus was there in their presence. What an encouragement. Notice what he does. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the presence of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Jesus had already told them in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 that the Holy Spirit was coming. He says it was expedient for him to go. It was important that he would go, that the Holy Spirit might come. He said, I will not leave you comfortless, but he will come to us. And we can know his presence spiritually and what an encouragement it is to know Jesus' presence. And let me give you one more thing. 
meeting with Jesus empowers. Notice what it says here at the end of the verse, verse four. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall, but listen, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. You know, when you get in the presence of Christ, there's a power that comes upon you. The Holy Spirit of God was promised to the disciples if they would just simply go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. Now, let me give you a, a little bit of math here very quickly. Jesus died at Passover. Three days will pass before he would rise again. He would show himself alive for 40 days uh, among the disciples in some 500 plus people. So 43 days have passed since Passover. The Bible tells us that Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. That means 50 minus 43 is seven. For seven days, the disciples must wait. You say, why so long? That's not the point. The point is this. They went into Jerusalem, into an upper room, and for 70 days, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, they continued there in supplication, in one accord, praying for one another. So I imagine they were singing. Peter got up and appointed another apostle. They preached a little bit. They had church, if you will, for seven days, and they waited. Here's the point. You shouldn't do anything without the Holy Spirit. They were not to go anywhere without his power or his presence. They were not to begin their ministries they were not to go into all the world. The Bible says in verse 8, but ye, receive, shall, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. There was a sequence of events to take place. First, get the Holy Ghost, and then after that, you can go into all the world. Now understand this. In John chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus breathed on them, the disciples, and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Peter was not out of line preaching to that group. They were not out of line in appointing another disciple under the power of the Holy Spirit. But there was 120 people in that upper room who also needed the Holy Spirit. And he came and he empowered the church on that day called Pentecost. Don't go anywhere without the presence of God and don't do any spiritual labor without the presence of God. Just wait on him. Look at, first of all, Letter A, it empowers expectations. Look at verse 6. When they got into his presence, they got excited. They said, when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? This is not the first time Jesus was asked this question. That was what they were hoping on Palm Sunday when they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They believed he was the king coming to claim his throne. This was not the first time he was asked if he would restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus, time after time, tried to teach them the truth. And finally, he says, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons. But that does not temper the expectations of the disciples. They expected God's kingdom. Friends, I live the same way as the disciples do. Because of God's Holy Spirit put in my life the day I got saved, I'm expecting the soon return of Jesus Christ. I believe that he will come and one day he will rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He already is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he will establish a kingdom upon this earth. It empowers our expectations. Boy, when you get in the presence of God, it'll excite you and give you great expectations. But look at this. It also empowers evangelism, verse 8. It empowers evangelism. When the Holy Ghost was to come, they were to be witnesses unto them, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and uttermost parts of the earth. In lesson three, we're going to talk more about Acts chapter one and verse eight. And I want you to wait until then before we get too deep on that. But what an exciting thing to think that the Holy Spirit has come. And let me just give you a little bit of a, a teaser. Ye shall be, not you might be, you are a witness, friend. 
Whether you like to admit it or not, you can be a good one or a bad one, but you are a witness. You know, the Holy Spirit is here for us to have power. He is here for us to, to have joy and to know His presence. There's a purpose in meeting with Christ. It, it encourages, it exalts, it, 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 it gives us great em, empowerment, it gives us expectations, it edifies us, it helps us. So friend, take some time and find His presence. Get into His Word. Go boldly today to the throne of grace. And there you can meet with Jesus. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Help us with it, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night.